There's a wonderful story in the history of the internet which involves you sitting on a bathroom floor. Apparently the tiles were very cold on your ass and you were staying overnight with some friends. You didn't want to wake them up and you started working on a document now known as RFC1. Yep. And this is the document that defines the entire history, the entire technology that is now shaping the world. That's not too much of a claim. Um, maybe you were standing on the shoulders of some giants, but why were you on a bathroom floor? <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting how history gets rewritten a little bit. <laughs> I wasn't sitting, I was standing. Um, and so I didn't have to worry about the cold floor. Uh, but I was, I was in a bathroom. Uh, it was very late at night, around 3 o'clock in the morning, and there were people sleeping all over the house, and I did not want to wake them up. Um, so this is tied to a rather uh, amazing and interesting um, uh, startup uh, issue, which is pretty different from anything today. When the network was started, there were some very smart people who uh, had a significant amount of experience behind them, and the plan was a formal structure for the, uh, called the nuts and bolts of moving the bits around, the creation of what you would now call a router. Uh, the word hadn't been invented exactly, but uh, the first routers were uh, built under a fairly good specification, um, a formal contract, professional people, and they did a first-class job. What was not done in the same way was to figure out what to do with this network. Uh, instead, the network was built in a very rich environment, and by rich I don't mean so much money, <coughs> excuse me, but I mean one where there was a lot of technological prowess. The uh, office that uh, funded it, the agency that funded the network, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, had a history of supporting uh, really high-class uh, uh, research in computer science, among other technologies. And uh, so there were laboratories around the U.S. that were doing work in artificial intelligence, in advanced operating systems, in advanced uh, uh, computer graphics, in, in very interactive systems, uh, in big databases, big at the time, small by today's standards, um, uh, fancy architectures, multiple computer architectures. And so in each of the different laboratories, we're talking about Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Carnegie Mellon University, University of California, Berkeley, UCLA, where I was, uh, University to Utah, um, Harvard, uh, uh, and so forth, um, there were uh, really important uh, work going on under senior professors. And the network, the ARPANET, which is called the network because it was the only network around, um, was built in that environment. So the, the places that were connected were those laboratories. Mm -hmm. And in those laboratories you had uh, not only the professors who ran them, but you had a whole set of graduate students and related staff members. And so you had a, a pretty good set of people who were already involved in looking into the future in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And who were pretty capable from a uh, just a, a craft point of view of uh, they knew how to program, we knew what the structure of computers were, we knew what operating systems were. And so in a sense, connecting up our computers to the network was uh, just another task. Now yeah. it had a lot more interesting little details to it than it first seemed, but in some sense it was uh, kind of an ordinary uh, task. And, uh, and my own view actually was uh, that uh, it was not nearly as challenging from a technical perspective as the really big problems that we were worried about. I was concerned about, I was interested in artificial intelligence. I wanted to know how the mind worked. And this business of connecting computers to a network uh, seemed much less challenging as a sort of mundane. And I used to sneer that it only had socially redeeming value, that it, it, it didn't have any real depth to it. I acknowledge that I was wrong, that it's a more complicated business, but that was the idea. So in that environment, sort of a long answer to your question, uh, there was a careful structure about the, the hardware necessary and the uh, long lines uh, to connect the, the, the routers together. And then there was an openness saying, well, let's put it there and see what these guys do with it. Mm -hmm. And a very, very light hand from Washington uh, suggesting what to do. And the rest was self-organizing. And had we not self-organized and had we not made progress, I'm sure that they would have stepped in and you know, done something else. But uh, the, those of us who were in the first four sites, the, the initial network was four sites, and UCLA and Santa Barbara and SRI up Menlo Park and University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And so the first thing that happened was people from these four sites uh, came together just to meet each other. And very quickly, we uh, realized that we had much to talk about with each other, and we agreed to keep talking with each other. 
And in fact, uh, the first thing we did, the first decision we made was to go visit each other's laboratories, uh, which was exciting to us because we were young and this was uh, interesting to see what was going on. And we also understood instantly, immediately, that uh, the irony, uh, this network was supposed to reduce travel, and the first thing we did was increase our travel. Right. And, um, and eventually, I wound up doing enough travel that uh, the budget had to be increased and the contract modification had a serious, um, a serious impact there. Um, Go ahead. So, on that, on that, when you started this communication, yeah. you know there were six of you in the first network working group, I, I believe. Some number, some, yeah, more. And th okay, more. So three. You were one of three who had been to high school together, yeah. uh, and a few of you guys were were graduate students of Leonard Kleinrock. Yeah. And as far as I remember, you were just one year after your undergraduate. So you're kind of bottom of the academic pile. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> firmly, firmly at the bottom. Yeah. So um, first of all, this business of being at the bottom of the academic pile. So as I said, these, these sites were all being run by professors that had their own research agenda. And this network was a, a sideshow, an intrusion. It was okay. They were, they were willing to have it. They couldn't say no because the money was coming from the same place. But, but it wasn't their agenda. Yeah. And so they passed it down. And, uh, and it was forced uh, on them by ARPA, wasn't it? For, forced is a strong word, uh, and in fact, let me let me. Uh, it's interesting. Let me yeah. let me the the dynamics there. Uh, the uh, ARPA decided they were going to build it. Um, the various professors around the uh, ne around the um, community had different re uh, reactions, and uh, a somewhat peculiar uh, thing is that in the east there was more negative reaction, and in the west there was more positive reaction. And I don't know if there's a strong reason for that, but typically the ones on the east were older, more established, had, had very rich facilities uh, that they built up over the years. And uh, to first order, their reaction was, why should we be sharing our facilities with these other people? Yeah. And so they viewed it as a, as a potential intrusion. Whereas the ones in the west were newer, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them, uh, Klein Rock, particularly at UCLA, was, uh, had done a lot of the theoretical work related to networking, so he was quite excited about this. Um, and and so we um, so so that's the story of how it got down to the graduate student level. And uh, I don't know if it's common elsewhere, but in the U.S., one of the common sayings is that graduate students are the second lowest form of life um, <laughs> on the university campus. I've been that soldier. Yeah. So uh, so then we talked. We wound up talking to each other. Now, as it turned out, uh, the three of us had gone to the same high school. Uh, Vince Cerf and I had been friends in high school, and. Um, there's a whole little story about how we wound up together at UCLA. John Postel had also gone to high school uh, at the same time. We didn't actually, I didn't know him at the time. I, I met him uh, uh, as a graduate student there. Um, exactly how far out of uh, undergraduate school were we? It was more than a year. Um, Vint and I were nominally class of 65. I was uh, slow getting out of school, but Vint graduated in 65, worked for a year, and then came to UCLA. So we were a couple of years out of school. And, uh, well, let me, before we, we move into the, the present and the future, yeah. just digging back into the, those early days of RFC 1 again, the language you use in this document, and for, for people watching, I'll explain that these are the documents, they're now in the over 6,000s, yeah. that specify every technology on the Internet, really. The language that you started to use in those documents referred to considerably less than authoritative ideas. <laughs> that, that's from RFC 3, right? And, and, you know, the idea was an RFC, one of these documents could be one line if you wished or yeah. one word. And even the title, Request for Comments, you weren't saying, this is how it is, suck it up. Uh, now, that imbued the entire project with a certain style, a certain openness, that rough consensus, you know, no kings, Dave uh, Clark thing. And you can see that that permeated through the technology. Uh, here's the question. That was a long, a long non-question. There's a lot of discussion over the last 10, 15 years, and with Linux and with Wikinomics, yeah. about opening up and when you want to run things, being as open as possible. Yeah. And people don't realize, but they are actually harking back to what you did sure. in that bathroom, what you started. But the way that you worked was that you were working as part of a hierarchy, actually. And you were working with people of like mind, many of whom knew each other and understood each other's problems. So if you were running this project and it, it wasn't within academia and it wasn't all funded by ARPA, 
do you think the RFC approach could have worked? And is it a model for how things can happen in the future? Yeah, so let me... Um let me make it all more humble than than it you know it wasn't it wasn't with great insight and foresight about you know this is the way it's going to happen there was uh, RFC three which is what you're referring to which set the rules for the for the RFCs uh, was the solution to a um, a personal uh, problem which was the following after several months of inter intermittently interacting with each other around these four laboratories. Um, so we had met each other in August of 68, and then around uh, March of 69, we said, you know, a bunch of interesting ideas here, we better start writing them down. And uh, that caused uh, a, a bit of a problem, because nobody had given us any authority. And I was very, and I, uh, each of us took an assignment, and uh, in addition to each of the writing assignments that we took, I said, oh, and I'll, I'll organize them. And everybody said, fine, they hated administrative work, and I should have not done it myself. But anyway, <laughs> so I took that on, and I thought it was a trivial task. And I found myself pausing and uh, putting it off and, and really uh, getting quite nervous about it, including losing sleep. And uh, I had to introspect and understand what it was that was bothering me. And what was bothering me was that I was very nervous that we were going to get yelled at, that we were going to get uh, criticized for being presumptuous, for asserting ourselves. Mm -hmm. Nobody had told us we were in charge. Nobody, I figured somebody uh, important was going to show up, and they were going to come from the east, no doubt. I didn't know whether it was going to be Boston or Washington, but I was sure somebody was going to show up and say, who are you, what are you doing, and, and, you know, and I'm in charge. So that was very much on my mind. And... Um, uh, the other thing is I have uh, difficulty writing, personally. And so writing formal documents that uh, meet the, the standards that one would want uh, is, is always a big challenge. So as I was strung, stumbling over this, I hit upon two things. One was to say that these documents did not have any authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other was to reduce the threshold for being able to write one. And uh, that's where the one sentence, and it can be incomplete, it can be a question without an answer, and it can be a design without an implementation, et cetera, all came from. Uh, figuring that with, since they don't have any authority, you could write it and replace it and replace it and replace it, and, and that would be a process that would go on. And then the, uh, the device of calling every one of them a request for comments was just one of those quirky moments that, that came and, uh, as a matter of form. And, and I thought it was temporary. I thought, you know, here we are, spring of 1969. In the fall, we'd have the network and we'd have formal documentation and these notes would disappear. We'd have a, a regular user's <laughs> manual and an architecture manual and so forth. And the idea that they kept going and going and going, and, and, and the 6,000 figure that you're talking about um, is somewhat different from the numbers that we issued at the beginning because every note had its own RFC number. And then when the Internet started to work and we had email and we had uh, then the creation of Internet drafts, which didn't get numbers, uh, so every one of the RFCs that you see today corresponds to 100 or so maybe uh, numbers that would have been issued if it had been done the old way. Okay. So the number on the same scale is probably closer to a half a million or a million and somewhere up there uh, in terms of these things. Um, if you could have told me that that's what was going to play out, I would say, it's crazy, that's stupid, you know, not going to happen. Uh, let me ask you then uh, something that kind of brings us closer to the future. Yeah. The history of the Internet is the story of at least two attempts where the U.S. government tried to gift the private sector a revolutionary new technology. So back in the early 60s, you know, Baran, working with Rand, approaches AT&T, and AT&T tells him, buzz off. And then in the mid-70s, you would have been in the same position as well. You know, there, there was an industry opposition to the new technology. Clearly, there's a big irony there. Um, but this conflict between the private sector and the military-funded networks, uh, it, it, it taps into two things. First, people thought there was a market distortion, potentially, from having massive, massive military expenditure in this kind of R&D. And second, as soon as the commercial, as soon as the industrial side picked up on the technology, it inevitably changed the character of that technology. So uh, do you have thoughts on those two things, and, and do they jump out at you? 
Um, I, I can't speak to the particular history of, of Brand's interaction with anybody. Uh, he was working on a slightly different problem, and it was not uh, a direct relationship, to, even though there was you know, some notions of packet switching in there. Uh, it is the case that uh, AT&T was approached for taking over the ARPANET in the early 70s, and they walked away from it. Um, and I suspect that there were other various kinds of interactions over time. Um, it, it, it is a very interesting phenomena about the impact of the spending by the U.S. government, particularly through through DARPA. So uh, the DARPA history is is maybe special in its own right. Uh, DARPA, I say DARPA now, it was created at what is called ARPA, and then it got renamed DARPA, and then it got called ARPA again, and then now it's DARPA, and I just tend to use DARPA regularly. Uh, it was created in response to Sputnik. The U.S. government was caught off guard when the Russians put up the, uh, their first net, uh, um, satellite. And uh, uh, the institutional reaction was, uh, we've been caught flat-footed. We've got to prevent such a thing from happening again. And of the several things that happened in response, the creation of this agency, which was given extremely broad authority to create technology and uh, not ask permission, but just go do it. Um, and it, and it, it suffered quite a lot of uh, bureaucratic infighting. The military wanted to kill it off. They didn't like it. The Army, Navy, and Air Force were not happy at all about having this other agency that was not under their control uh, try to create. Now they love it. Uh, you know, it's, it totally transformed things. Um, so the fact that they were able to spend money and to do it in a way that did not create um, enormous and immediate competition among the people doing the work. There was competition for research funding, but it wasn't competition so much for the commercial dollar initially. Uh, really made a big difference. I was in um, uh, at a small school in rural Peru a couple years ago uh, on an impromptu visit uh, and uh, talking about the internet to um, middle schoolers. And uh, one of the best questions that I've ever heard was uh, from one of the kids, and he listened to what I said. He said, so why did the military invest in the network? Like, this seems like a strange thing for them to do. And so I had to reach back, and I had to explain about the understanding that had developed from the previous years about the importance of science and engineering in building military technology in World War II, uh, radar and computers and so forth. And uh, that that wisdom, in a certain sense, led to a very uh, uh, expansive role in terms of funding research with a, uh, a, a uh, call it a, uh, an adult or evolved understanding that you must not try to control exactly everything that's going on, that it's important to sort of cast your bread upon the waters and wait and see what happens. And there's been a lot of research uh, showing that it's hard to predict exactly. There's a famous report uh, tracking several technologies that were funded by uh, the government, and then funding sort of disappeared. And then what emerged later is billion-dollar industries, multiple billion-dollar industries, because the work had paid off and it had led to commercial activity and so forth. And so the Internet, you know, not in a planned way. I mean, trying to transfer it over to AT&T didn't go anywhere. Yeah. And, uh, and now, um, you know, the world's changed substantially. Of so, Dr. Crocker, if I can ask you about an issue that's been present from the beginning, in a yeah. sense, uh, it's privacy. Uh, do you have fears or are you optimistic about privacy being an enduring issue that's going to uh, change how people behave online or, or affect business online? Yeah, so this privacy uh, is a um, two-edged sword. Uh, if you walk into a hotel that you've frequented before and the concierge greets you by name and has your favorite drink waiting, is that a violation of privacy or is that high-quality service? And uh, that tension is permeating entirely through at least the commercial side of things. So on the advertising side, you have... Um, you know, targeted advertising for you as much as they know about you. Is that a violation of your privacy or is that a, a service? Um, and even one could argue for in terms of government keeping records or other people keeping records. Um, I think that there's no perfect solution. I don't, I don't think that there are any absolute um, uh, uh, marks to, to 
sit on and say, you know, this is the line and we, we don't want to cross this. Um, and so there's going to be a very complicated dance that plays out that involves uh, understanding the technology and uh, the shifts that it causes. Uh, we've moved from, as I, as I was saying uh, when I was on stage, from a world in which uh, when people lived in small towns, basically everybody knew each other and uh, uh, they knew pretty much everything there was to know about you. And if you wanted to keep it secret, you had to, you had to go to some lengths. To the uh, anonymity of big cities, and now we're moving back to where there's quite a lot of information known about you. Um, so one thing is to understand uh, the technology and its consequences. Another is to reset or to evolve our norms as to what's expected. Mm -hmm. If you do something stupid, um, is that a private thing that nobody should know about it? Or should you uh, know full well that it's going to be recorded, that it's going to be on YouTube, that you know, it's going to follow you around forever? And uh, will that do a lot of damage? It already does. Um, Maybe maybe parents can educate their children a little better. Children will do stupid things as they always do. Um, but you know, and then in terms of evaluating, so if somebody does something stupid as a as a teenager, does that have to damage their career forever? Um, not necessarily. Would you hire somebody uh, who you know didn't behave properly, but now they're ten years older? You might very well say, "Yeah, I remember that. I did it too." You know, and so forth. So I, I think I think this is going to require uh, evolution along multiple lines: evolution in terms of understanding technology, and and evolution in terms of um, deciding what's important and what's not so important. And um, uh, you know, I don't know exactly, uh, but keeping secrets obviously is going to be harder and harder. Let me ask you as a final question something that is a, a major a major fear, a major threat. Yeah. Um, you're one of the people who shaped the norms of a generation of engineers or else who reflected those norms. And they were about openness, humility, yep. trying to get things done under adverse circumstances. Now, if you're a young engineer, you're probably going to be given a very large salary if you move into, you know, web tech and you might be working for a very large corporation and you probably won't go into foundational science not necessarily and that may have an impact on the normal norms of engineers those norms may change and if they do change that means the architects of the the coming decades may have a completely different mindset to what you and your colleagues had are you worried about this do you think there needs to be a, a Hippocratic Oath or something like that I know that sounds nonsensical but do you have any thoughts on it I don't think my answer is going to uh, 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 go in the direction that you might be expecting. Um, everything has a kind of a, a time, and it doesn't last forever. Um, the environment in which the Internet was built reflected a particular time. Uh, the Internet itself, it, although it's an enormously important technology, it's obviously affected my life along with everybody else's, uh, is not going to be the story forever and ever and ever. Uh, there are many other big things happening in the world. And, uh, you know, you look around, uh, we have big issues with respect to the environment, um, and they will become more and more important over time. Uh, there are huge changes in biology and, and um, studies and that will have an impact uh, in everything from bioengineering of food to medicine and so forth. Those will be enormous big changes. Um, the communications of which the Internet is part of and other factors are also causing uh, changes in government structures. Uh, we've moved from a world in which uh, exploration of uninhabited or un ungoverned territories uh, was a very big deal in colonization and so forth, to a world in which um, most of the world is, is governed and uh, uh, you have the Westphalian model of uh, nation states. And uh, the question is, is its time coming to an end or is it just now maturing or whatever? So there's a lot of big forces at work and um, trying to place the ethic that you're describing about engineering in the context of um, the commercialization um, uh, versus the openness of communications and publication, uh, I think, is actually caught in a much bigger struggle. Yeah. And um, 
probably is not the most important question. Uh, a lot of my friends are very concerned about the level of research funding coming out of the U.S. government. Take that to the top level of the U.S. government, try to get a conversation about it, and the answer is they can't be, they're not involved in that at all because they've got gridlock in the budget, they've got uh, big, uh, very big issues. They've got, uh, you know, terrorism and uh, um, non-trivial issues that are occupying the very top levels of government. And we do not yet have a crisis that is competing at the same level as those things in terms of research funding. And as a consequence, you get a balance uh, that shifted between the openness in the universities versus um, uh, commercial activity. Dr. Crocker, thank you very, very much.